never going to live up to this. <laughs> Prepare to be unimpressed. Um, <laughs> can't take her anywhere, I swear. Um, so first and foremost, welcome to ancient Greece. The year is approximately 360 BCE, and Plato has just released his dialogues, Timaeus and Critias. In them, you will find a couple of throwaway lines about the lost civilization of Atlantis. For those of you unfamiliar with this origin story, it goes like this. The brutish Atlantean naval power conquers the platonic ideal city-state that is ancient Athens. The gods are pissed. They send Atlantis to a watery end through a series of earthquakes and floods, leaving nothing behind but an impassable muddy shoal. As far as stories go, it's not bad, but it's not particularly memorable. So one has to ask, why does nearly everybody in this audience know a thing or two about Atlantis? The key here is mystery. Everybody likes a good mystery. So it's important to note that even in Plato's time, some people believe that Plato's account of Atlantis was wholly fictional. Others believed it was stone cold fact. <laughs> Still others suspected that Plato took inspirational elements from recent and not so recent actual history to fabricate a compelling allegorical story that would teach people, that, would, that was just believable enough to teach people that the, le the lesson not to mess with the will of the gods or the perfection of the Athenian city state. Who actually was right? No one knows, except for Plato, and by this time he was dead. Um, several hundred years after Plato likely inspired, likely inspired New Age theorists, early New Age theorists, to invent some of the first in fashionable tinfoil headwear, philosophers were still discussing various theories of Atlantis, both questioning whether or not any of it was based on historical fact and analyzing various tantalizing clues given that might suggest where the mythical land might once have existed. In the 16th century, a spark was ignited in the search for Atlantis. Sir Thomas More and Sir Francis Bacon both <laughs> blended Plato's story with recent traveler's tales from America. Suddenly you had people wondering if perhaps those Mayan and Aztec ruins they were finding might actually be signs that Atlantis was somewhere in the New World. The spark was further ignited with this handsome fellow in the late 1800s. Populist writer, amateur, and I emphasize the word amateur, scientist. <laughs> Thank you. And Minnesota congressman. <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. <laughs> Ignatius Loyola Donnelly published a book called Atlantis, The Antediluvian World. It was with Donnelly that we came to associate Atlantis with all ancient and yet somehow still technologically advanced civilizations in general, in both the old world and the new. In fact, he also tied the, link, the sinking of Atlantis to the great flood of the Bible, further confusing the myth and its origins because apparently things weren't confusing enough already. <laughs> it's not only that people wanted to believe that such a place actually existed. It's that there was so much detail given about its features and possible location that one felt as though Atlantis had to be findable. So just for funsies, follow along here. From Timaeus. In front of the mouth which you Greeks call the Pillars of Heracles, there lay an island which was larger than Libya and Asia together. From Critias. The Egyptians described Atlantis as an island consisting mostly of mountains in the northern portions and along the shore and encompassing a great plain and an oblong shape in the south, extending in one direction 3,000 stadia, but across the center inland it was 2,000 stadia. 50 stadia from the coast was a mountain that was low on all sides, yada, 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 so on and so forth. The central <laughs> island itself, five stads in diameter, it goes on for a while. Um, according to the philosopher Proclus, Cranter, who was a student of Xenocrates, who himself was a student of Plato, it, it's on the chart, um, visited Egypt, talked to priests, saw hieroglyphs that confirmed that Atlantis actually existed. Furthermore, he gives the size of the island and a general location relative to other islands and corroborates the notion that it was in fact a thriving, advanced kingdom. So, where does this leave us today? Welcome to Santorini. <laughs> so, 
The name Santorini comes from the Latin Empire Cathedral of St. Irene and isn't really the real name of the place. It's kind of a Greek history, so I'm gonna stick with Greek names here. Welcome to Thera, the ancient name of modern day Thera. Because Greeks like lots of different <laughs> names for things. Nestled in the Aegean Sea, about 200 kilometers southeast of the Greek mainland and about 200 kilometers north of the island of Crete sits a small circular archipelago, the largest island of which is Thera. Its economy is based almost exclusively on tourism with a small artisanal wine industry and some uniquely delicious delicacies that owe to its climate and enriched volcanic soil. I highly recommend the little native tomatoes which are super sweet and tiny and delicious. Um, <laughs> The architecture there is typical of the area. Cubicle stone buildings dug into the hillside and whitewashed, occasional friendly cats peeking from around a corner and demanding pets because some things in history never change. <laughs> More relevant to this talk, however, near the southwestern tip of Thera is a Minoan Bronze Age settlement. That's about 4,000 years ago. Uh, it's called Akrotiri. Plato may have decided to exercise some significant artistic license in service of his Athenian ideal, but I think you'll come to see that Akrotiri is quite likely the very real inspiration behind the legend of Atlantis. Follow along here. So Akrotiri was a thriving fishing and farming village that was positioned quite strategically for trade throughout the Mediterranean. In addition to your typical art and pottery, the inhabitants were also involved in trading and processing copper, which was no small feat at that time. Indeed. Extensive excavations of the area show it to be a very modern and likely peaceful civilization. Hot and cold running water on tap in the Bronze Age. <laughs> Three-story buildings, again, in the Bronze Age. Uh, amazing frescoes, none of which depict warfare, and of course some elaborate furniture. Uh, honestly, if you ask me, it sounds like a pretty advanced civilization to me. How do we know all of this? Well, we know because of the way the site was preserved. Entombed in ash and pumice over 40 meters thick from the great, great Minoan eruption about 3,500 years ago. So, take a good look at this map. See the circular shape formed by these islands with little islands in the middle there? That is a surefire sign what you're looking at is a caldera. It's what happens when you're looking down on a huge volcano after it explodes. The Thera volcano has actually erupted many, many times over the last hundred thousand, several hundred thousand years. It's a cycle, and it looks something like this. At least it does from the side. Um, after a large volcano erupts, it's a very happy sun. I love it when people read stuff. Um, after a large volcano erupts, it collapses into a circular water-filled caldera of islands. Over time, the caldera slowly fills up with new magma, building a new volcano. The pressure builds up, the new volcano erupts rather violently, lather, <laughs> rinse, repeat. So how big a deal was this Thera eruption? Well, just before this Minoan eruption, the ring of islands that make up Santorini, Thera, Thera, whatever you want to call it, was nearly continuous. There was only a small gap between the modern large island of Thera and the tiny little island that's a dot on the screen there called Aspronisi. Just wide enough for boats to get through to do the whole trade thing that made them so prosperous. In more scientific terms, on a volcanic explosivity index scale, which goes from zero to eight, this sucker was possibly a six, likely a seven. They're not really sure, but it was freaking huge. It ejected up to four times as much crap as Krakatoa did in the 1800s. Yeah, big. In terms of how much junk this volcano spewed into the atmosphere, there are only three other eruptions that have been found to be larger. It was a big freaking deal, and you can bet that it might have had an impact on surrounding lands and been heard about in places like Greece, where Plato lived, and in Egypt, where all those supposed Atlantis hieroglyphs existed. What's more, there were a lot of people who lived to tell the tale and pass it down from generation to generation. Of all the things found in the ruins of Akrotiri, the only human remains dug up were the ones formerly interred there. It seems that over the many stages of the eruption process, the inhabitants of the island had several weeks, maybe even months, to prepare and pack up their booties into their boats and get the heck out of there which is probably good because Seth posted a link on something weird about what happens to the bodies of Pompeii and is disgusting. Just, it's gross. Anyway, they did, the inhabitants did leave, managed to leave behind plenty of neat stuff. 
to be buried for thousands of years, making for some awesome mysteries to solve, and providing me, personally, with some epic vacation photos. <laughs> so, a toast. To the former inhabitants of Akrotiri, or Atlantis, for getting out and for leaving behind many enticing and mysterious breadcrumbs that we are still trying to gather and decipher 3,500 years later. <laughs>